Welcome, welcome to the eighth lecture of the continual learning course offered at the University of Pisa in conjunction with Continual AI and the AI Doctoral Academy. In this lecture, uh, we will focus on frontiers in continual learning. So this lecture is, is going to uh, just show you a few interesting ideas uh, we can discuss together. Um, about cutting edge, let's say, research uh, frontiers uh, in continual learning, but it's not meant to be like comprehensive and uh, of all the possibilities uh, that you can and people are exploring right now. Uh, so uh, it's just a taste of what you could do if you just try to um, expand a little further, let's say, the uh, contours that, that we have seen in this course. Um, so uh, more practically, the lecture is going to be split in three different parts. So the first part will be about a few advanced topics in continual learning uh, that I think you should really know and uh, a few interesting future directions uh, that I also think are quite interesting. But uh, again, uh, uh, I may be wrong. <laughs> uh, and then we will focus on two main, let's say, research track, research areas in continual learning that I, are, are particularly interesting. And we're actually pursuing here even at the University of Pisa and um, we will hear directly from uh, Antonio Carta and Andrea Cosso about these two trajectory, in particular, continual distributed learning, how we can see continual learning not only as this uh, uh, single agent uh, view that we have seen across the whole course, and how we can uh, expand this idea of continual learning, mixing um, it with, uh, with uh, distributed learning ideas and uh, related you know, uh, research endeavors. And then uh, a second track about continual sequence learning. So this idea of trying to uh, see these often um, orthogonal learning paradigms. So this idea of learning from sequences of data and patterns and this idea of learning continually over time, how can they can be merged together somehow in a more coherent view and uh, what's interesting to pursue in terms of research and applications in this area. So let's start with the, the first part uh, of the lecture about these ad more advanced topics and future directions you may take even in your own research. Uh, so one first interesting topic that we couldn't uh, address in this short course um, is uh, the relationship of continual learning with meta-learning approaches. So probably this will be discussed over even in the invited lectures from GADA that is here uh, and uh, and uh, and there are a lot of uh, interesting works that have been published in this area in the last few years, uh, but I think that they may seem as a bit more articulated and uh, uh, complex with respect to the first basic methodologies. And so this is why I think that um, I think that uh, this this is kind of a, a more advanced approach to continue learning, and I'm sure that. We will be able to 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 learn from this uh, during the the as I mentioned the the official uh, 40 plus hour scores that we are going to have next year at the University of Pisa, uh, held by, by Antonio here. Uh, and uh, so, talking about uh, meta learning and the intersection with continual learning. Uh, so, before really delving into it, I think it it is worth uh, distinguish. The main ideas that are at the very basis, uh, basic of, of this uh, discipline. So meta learning has been mostly focused in the past, even in the present, on this idea of being able to learn how to learn better. So the idea is that to find a way so that given a new task, a new evidence, you're able to maybe uh, yeah, a, a learning objective, you're able to learn quicker and in a more efficient and effective way based on a previous, uh, let's say, um, exposure to different tasks uh, and uh, your previous uh, um, ability to solve them somehow. So it, it's at, at the meta level because we are not saying that explicitly that the knowledge that we have uh, that we have learned about a particular topic may be a task may be used for the current and future task, but you're saying that that experience of learning itself may be used to learn better how to, 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 to learn uh, in the future. And, and this is uh, this focus is quite different from continual learning. It is more about learning robust, uh, reusable representation uh, from uh, non-stationary data, as we discussed in this course. 
but of course, many topics, many approaches, many ideas uh, are indeed in common, as you may imagine. And so, so traditionally, meta learning, uh, for example, has been studied in a static concept. That is, I have a set of tasks, I learn, uh, you know, a meta model. So that is somehow telling me that the best way to learn and adapt to a new task. And then what I have is just one additional task on which I test my meta learning approach. So it is not definitely a stream of, of tasks that you encounter over time, but you have a, a fit set say, of tasks you want to leverage uh, learning on an on a N minus one, let's say, task, uh, what we are learning learning about this task in, in, the, in the follow one, but following one. But forget for example, was not really a problem given the setup that has been always the focus on meta learning. Uh, and again, also there, there is a kind of a, a notion of a knowledge transfer but it's not the main, um, let's say, focus of, of the of the techniques that have been also uh, designed and developed within this uh, research uh, landscape. Then, of course, um, you know, um, many different approaches and ways of, of, of uh, mixing these two uh, ideas, main ideas and, and approaches together have been proposed. But, um, I think that uh, we can split them in two main categories, what they are called as the meta continuous learning approaches and uh, a second set of, of um, approaches that may uh, be called continual meta learning approaches. So <laughs> it's kind of, of a play of words here, but uh, the first, um, the first um, category is mostly about the idea of applying meta learning approaches to solve continual learning and forgetting and all the issues related to continual learning. So essentially here, what uh, you can you can uh, think of doing, like on the image on the right, as it was taken by this paper, Embracing Change, Continual Learning Deep Neural Networks, um, by I think uh, Raya Hadzel et al, sorry, I, I missed this. But essentially what you see is uh, a, a few sequences of tasks which, you have the ability in this case to, to process uh, uh, all at once somehow and you want to learn a meta model that should be able to re somehow change the, the activation the weights control somehow how um, a single model would uh, learn over this sequence of tasks um, uh, but implicitly learning this uh, through a, a meta learning process so essentially we're the idea is to instead of trying with our, you know, um, knowledge uh, and, uh, and and you know our known um, intuition as a researcher, what's the best way to learn from a sequence of tasks? Let instead uh, an algorithm choose the best way to to do this uh, with with an additional say, meta learning model uh, that would uh, that uh, would solve uh, the continuous learning uh, problem uh, overall. Uh, but I mean, this kind of approach is a bit limiting in a sense because you need to have access to a sequence of tasks uh, all at once. And um, it is not clear if this particular approach would scale on distributions that we have never seen before, uh, or quite distant from the ones that you have seen during this meta training phase. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see the meta learning and if this approach to continue learning as kind of a evolutionary scheme in which you may imagine uh, to have some uh, some notion of say, to control forgetting as developed through uh, you know uh, hundreds of millions of years to evolution, and then you have this basic ability to learn continuity that is arising, let's say, from this uh, continual say, exposure to different uh, sequence of of experiences. Um, then there is this second approach, let's say, uh, trying to mix these the, the different um, uh, paradigms. Uh, more on the opposite side of the coin. So using continual learning to try to learn to learn uh, over time. So this idea to update continually a meta learning model so that you're able to, to use what we are learning, continual learning to improve our meta learning abilities. I, I know that it may seem a bit convoluted, but if you reason about, about this a uh, little more, uh, you see that two different, uh, completely different, uh, say, ideas and uh, that of course, many different uh, approaches at intersection between the two that are maybe using both uh, may be possible. And so it's quite nice to uh, uh, 
think this through a little more and to see what are the interesting um, points at intersection between between the two uh, interesting research areas. Then um, within these uh, these course, we have always focused, uh, you know, implicitly on the idea to learn uh, with a supervised uh, signal available but also in some sense being kind of agnostic to it. So many of the approaches that we have seen have been developed definitely on uh, uh, sound specific uh, application areas like computer vision mostly and uh, to this notion of a supervised signals is available uh, along the each, each pattern, each image, for example. Uh, at the same time, many of the approaches we have seen, they are quite agnostic with the with kind of level of supervision that you may encounter over time. So for example, AWC or or learning without forget things, it is, you know, applying distillation and approaches uh, may be definitely applied also to other contexts that are quite uh, orthogonal in terms of amount of supervision. And one of these being uh, uh, continual reinforcement learning. So um, reinforcement learning has been, as for meta learning, traditionally separate, let's say, field with a different objective in mind, but uh, as many uh, interesting, uh, what I say here, uh, uh, shared constraints that uh, would put these two fields very close to each other. Um, so reinforcement learning is being mostly focused on this idea of learning from sometimes poor, sparse rewards, so from very uh, sparse and, and uh, uncoherent even uh, uh, surrogates provide signals. Uh, but but um, as for continual learning, the idea through which this uh, concept is being pursued has been always subject to this uh, constraint, for example, having a single agent that is exploring uh, an often non stationary uncontrolled world um, and, uh, and that um, uh, is subject to somehow a sample bias, right? So it, it, it can just collect new observations that it can, can encounter over time, for example, playing a game, exploring an environment, uh, but essentially cannot control the source of data and uh, how these, these, sample, these, these examples are sampled from the environment. Um, so this puts um, reinforcement learning mostly in, uh, in a continuous learning um, regime as, as we have defined it from the first lecture of this course. So it is quite interesting. Uh, and indeed, you can see a lot of different strategies developed within reversible learning. They can be used somehow for continuous learning, for example, replay, experience replay. Uh, and on the opposite end, uh, you may have strategies developed traditionally in, uh, in uh, continuous learning, like AWC, elastic weight consolidation, being applied naturally through to, to reversible learning algorithms. Um, so here, uh, if you're interested in intersection between continuous learning and reinforcement learning, I suggest you to go through this uh, survey, recent survey paper from Kedar Paul et al. Uh, towards continuous reinforcement learning, a review and perspectives. That's quite, quite a nice summary uh, with recent deep continuous learning, uh, reinforcement learning works uh, in, the, in this area. And uh, here they also propose uh, a taxonomy uh, of uh, different approaches in continuous reinforcement learning that it's uh, quite different from the one we have seen in, uh, in, uh, in as exposed as a fuzzy categorization in continuum learning, but may be interesting to explore and to see um, what are the, the relationship with respect to the, to the one um, uh, that was proposed here. Um, so here uh, I just wanted to show a couple of highlights just because I have this video I really wanted to put it inside this course but um, of uh, an example of a continual reinforcement learning strategy that I actually worked on when I was a PhD and then uh, was recently published in 2020. Uh, there was this continual reinforcement learning in 3D non-stationary environments paper in which you can see there's an agent that has been trained here is the, the actual agent playing to collect, pick up uh, different objects in a very complex and non-stationary environment. Um, so it has to pick up a col green columns and avoid these uh, blue lanterns, right? So these blue lanterns gives a negative reward for the agent and these green columns uh, gives a positive reward for the agent. What's nice is that you can see how smoothly the, the agent is actually moving around, is turning around by itself. No one taught this agent that has to do that behavior uh, so it can create like very complex event behaviors uh, uh, to avoid as much as possible these uh, these lanterns and then collect uh, columns. But there's also one a nice point in which uh, 
it's, it's a bit dubious on what to do. Then it sees a couple uh, of columns uh, and uh, landers in it, say, okay, I, I will go through it. <laughs> they fix it all, so that's nice. And it, it seems to be kind of a smart agent after all, even if it's just uh, learning from, uh, from uh, rows for signals. So, so in this environment, uh, uh, you essentially, I, I created this environment in bits, uh, no, not bits too, but um, slay, with Slade. And um, essentially, this is a tool based on, on Doom. I don't know if you play the game, uh, but it's a, it's a tool that was developed originally for the Doom game and then allows you to create interesting environments, uh, virtual environments. Um, and uh, essentially, there I was able to change the, the, the shape and uh, the, the, the visual features of uh, a bit of objects and uh, the surrounding environment, so light and uh, textures of the walls and uh, so on and so forth. With this idea that we would like to see an agent that is able uh, within these very non stationary environments that they cannot control to learn still how to, to, to generalize the idea, for example, that columns, no matter the shapes and the colors they have, are good to pick up and the landers are good to avoid, for example. Uh, and so here, uh, just to tell you a straightforward application at WC that we, we did here, uh, we based on the essentially the, the change in the reward, we would consolidate uh, past knowledge and make space to, to new uh, knowledge uh, in, within the same agent model, right, the same model. Uh, so essentially, the assumption there was if, if at some point the agent is not able to solve that, that task anymore, uh, as we would uh, assume, right, so based on the past experience, uh, we, we, are, we are predicting a, a particular reward, then we see that the performance drop, that means somehow that uh, the environment has changed, something has changed, I'm not able to solve the task anymore. So uh, this would naturally trigger like consolidation step, like for example with the AWC, uh, to make sure that uh, we don't lose the, the past knowledge about the world and we can learn about new stuff. So that was a straightforward application just to give you an idea what you can do with what you learn in this course, even apply to these more complex situations in which you don't have a direct uh, supervised signal for each example. Uh, yeah, um, then definitely there is a whole line, a new line of explorations uh, being tackled right now, and uh, I think they are going to be interesting for the future with respect to uh, continual reinforced, uh, unsupervised learning. So this idea of not even getting a few sparse rewards, but uh, trying to generalize to non um, uh, unsupervised stream of data that we know are quite. Uh, large in terms of availability, uh, for example, from videos and uh, and images from the web and whatever. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, unlabeled data we can exploit, and I think that's a natural uh, sweeting, let's say, um, uh, scenario for a continued learning algorithm where you don't uh, want to continually provide labels to it, and that's quite of a strong assumption. Even though there are some strategies that you can have, uh, you can. Um, develop to avoid, you know, this constant labeling as with the one we have seen in uh, in the uh, on the edge application uh, um, object recogn recognizer. And so, uh, and I think that um, there is also quite a reason. Probably I, I'm going. I'm, I'm disconnected, right, from Teams. Uh, but yes, uh, we try to 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 go on. <laughs> I, I hear uh, like a bad noise. <laughs> but um, so um, why I think this is not still the case is that uh, it, it needs a change in the parting. So this idea that we should try to um, work on uh, a magnitude higher number of uh, data that we are currently kind of modeling today. That stuff, uh, given the technology that we have available today, right? And it's difficult to scale in terms of computational uh, power and uh, you know um, uh, memory allocations and, and and so on and so forth. Uh, even today, so it's quite difficult to see how we can start prototyping algorithms that can work with uh, with uh, millions of examples and uh, and data. Um, and uh, for now, it allows for, I think, uh, uh, less impactful application. So um, if you really want to make it done, for example, for, for businesses or to, to interesting use cases you want to model nowadays, we know that the re a reasonable um, 
approach is to just collect uh, enough label data that would model your specific task and that would give you impressive performance uh, uh, um, and a, this is uh, this is uh, not often the case uh, if you want to stick to just unsupervised learning i guess we are still in this in the stage in which like, we, we we can pick we can still pick these low hanging fruits from supervised learning and uh, and so these are a few, a couple of reasons why uh, continuous supervised learning has been put on hold, other than the basic, natural, and easiest uh, way to just focus on what works better right now, that is supervised uh, continue, uh, continue learning. Uh, and but what I wanted to show here with this image from Lacan, taken from uh, his, uh, one of his keynotes, I think uh, New Rips 2016, um, is that uh, it is reasonable to assume that if you want to create strong and uh, AI systems, then uh, unsupervised learning would uh, would uh, have an important role uh, as uh, the, the essentially the, the whole cake. Um, then supervised learning would be kind of the icing of this cake, and reinforcement learning would be just the cherry on top of it, uh, just the final touches, you know, to correct some behaviors. But most of the learning part and the intelligence part would be related to the our ability to learn. I, I would say continually over a stream of unsupervised data. Um, Okay, so this is what just an example. Very quickly, I think you can read through the paper uh, of a continual unsupervised uh, learning approach. It was proposed uh, a couple of years back uh, in Europe's, uh by by Rao et al. Um, and essentially, it's just a straightforward application. What we have seen already uh, in the past, right? So the multi-ad kind of approach, uh, but instead of having uh, a discriminative classifier here, you would have several, let's say, generative models that share some layers. Um, and you would try to model um, examples that you encounter over time, um, and, and, and essentially trying to be able to replicate, to generate them back in the input space. And uh, and with this fully generative approach, uh, you can of course be learned by being like a completely unsupervised in a sense. Um, you can have this uh, mixture of Gaussian, uh, uh, with, with, uh, in this case, with a dynamic expansion approach, so that you can uh, model, let's say, new groups of, uh, of discrete clusters, I say, in the data. Uh, so even if they're not uh, classes, uh, they may be like say, related concepts that you model over time. And then you can use these uh, these embeddings that you can uh, uh, you can you can create through these um, the first, let's say, compression part of the generation the generator to classify these objects appropriately, right? Um, this is cool. It's quite straightforward, I would say. Uh, it's something that uh, many of us have thought as possible, but the problem is that nowadays it's quite difficult to scale generative models uh, to, let's say, I-dimensional uh, data problem. Uh, so, uh, for example, this paper was, well, the approach of this paper was tested on a mist and a lot. It's difficult to think of, um, um, and, uh, of this approach as, um, scaled on, uh, for example, uh, image net size uh, problems. And, uh, but, but I, I, I guess that uh, with an improved way of, uh, and generative models in general, I think that would, that would open uh, a path to, to more um, interesting or robust, even continual, continual and supervised uh, reinforcement lear uh, learning approaches. Um, and, uh, and, and, even though we, we discussed also in this course that it is possible to work with, you know, within some kind of a latent space, uh, so that may be an initial trick we can leverage to scale. Okay, so then very quickly, I'm gonna mo move through um, uh, a few ideas uh, to, interesting ideas to explore, uh, mostly within continual unsupervised learning, uh, but at the intersection, say, of, of, um, of this approach, continue learning, and other interesting ideas that have been proposed um, in recent uh, deep learning literature, but even uh, starting from uh, from from other um, in, in research endeavors in the past. So one interesting idea, uh, I think, uh, would be to start reasoning about approaches, continue learning approaches that would leverage uh, recent advanced in self-supervised learning. So self-supervised learning is, um, I think, kind of a relabeling uh, also effort, if you want, uh, of uh, predictive learning or um, unsupervised learning even, more in general. And, uh, but but it's, it has this particular notion of trying to predict, uh, as, uh, as this slide from Lacan, predict part of, of the input 
uh, from any other part. So that, that, that's a quite powerful, I think, uh, um, way of describing self-supervised learning. And uh, these image essentially depicts a few uh, possible ways you can do it. So what's nice with self-supervised learning is that you don't need additional labels, right? So additional supervised signals that someone else brings into the problem, adds to the data. And so you can just start from this data. For example, in this case, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a video. So you can see this uh, embedding here as a slices in time, as a, a slice in time of the different images you encounter maybe over time. Uh, so a, a possible approach uh, is to predict the future from the past. So if you have, uh, if you have um, the patient, let's say, to wait to this kind of uh, split in time to be available to you, so you just need to wait, then what you can do is to train a model to predict the future, this uh, blue part of this red rectangle, given the past, right, this uh, violet one. And so you, you don't need actually uh, here um, additional uh, signals or uh, labels and you can use just the, the, the observations you have to learn how to predict the future somehow here. Uh, and uh, so the same can be done, uh, uh, you know, trying, for example, to predict the future from the recent past or predicting the past from uh, the present, predict the top from the bottom and so on and so forth. And that is exactly what uh, is done is in many self-supervised learning approaches. And, the name of self-supervised learning is also coming from this fact that you, you, you can use somehow supervised learning and the methods we have developed within supervised learning, but you don't need to actually explicit, explicitly label things and add, uh, you know, with a human intervention, your domain knowledge to it, let's say. Uh, so I think that all the, advanced, uh, the advances that we have seen in self-supervised learning may be interesting for continual learning. And this is something that also, I guess, Andrea will discuss later on with this idea of, uh, of sequence learning. That indeed, this is the next item here on the list. And can this somehow seen as, a, if it is a representation, as a kind of a self supervised learning? Uh, but, you know, there is a, an important uh, amount of literature in sequence learning that we can leverage as well, not, not necessarily linked to, to deep uh, neural networks, but neural networks in general and other approaches. Uh, that is all concerned with this idea of trying to find to, to exploit let's say the temporal correlation in data mostly um, and the structure in time uh, to learn more robust representation to solve uh, different applications and tasks uh, uh, more effectively so for example uh, here i report uh, uh, several different ways you can you can define a sequence learning problem as uh, I think described in a, I don't know if you reported here, but I think it, this was taken by a blog post by Carpati that was very uh, famous uh, uh, and uh, was showing the power of a recurrent neural network applied uh, to uh, different problems uh, in large scale as a formulation of those. Uh, and uh, so you can you can see, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, a sequence learning approach uh, as defined uh, um, as a, in, in a one to many task, for example, or many to one, or many to many, uh, and you know all these different combinations, and uh, each of those would make sense uh, with respect to a specific task, right? So, for example, this many to one task maybe may, may be useful for uh, modeling a sequence over time, and then try to I don't know classify a particular object uh, if you have maybe this additional sort of by signal uh, telling what this object is all about, for example. Um, or um, uh, a many-to-many -many, uh, approach uh, would be needed for, I don't know, uh, uh, translation tasks, machine translation tasks. And, uh, and you can think of all these uh, different, uh, different applications. But the core issue here is that you, you're able to model the sequence of the patterns. And uh, I think this is quite interesting for continued learning, especially considering that in, uh, in nature of biological learning systems, that no, there's no uh, like significant difference. I mean, there's no difference uh, with respect to continual learning and sequence learning. So they are two sides of the same coin, right? And uh, and they are studied uh, together. And uh, I think that um, a convergence in, the, in these uh, um, um, related areas may be fundamental for the future of of, the, of both fields, actually. Um, 
So another interesting idea that was uh, has become a very popular recently within the deep uh, the deep learning realm uh, is uh, contrastive learning. So that's powerful because even in this case, you know, you need a lot of um, labels, you need labels, uh, um, and um, and um, um, you can essentially randomly pick even examples and uh, make sure that uh, you're able to learn robust features just by. Uh, um, Describing to the model things that uh, artificially you 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 can say they they are they, they, they should be similar in terms of response and uh, things that should be possibly uh, different. Uh, so, for example, in here in this image, you can see a, a standard application or a basic idea in contrastive learning where you, you just take two random images uh, from your examples, maybe it's things that you see in your um, natural exploration of the world, and then. The only thing that you do here is to, to say, okay, I, I take two different crops, random crops from this image, uh, and I pass them through uh, our network, uh, the same model here, this uh, encoder. Uh, then and I get these different embeddings. And then I, I use a, a random crop of the second image. I pass that to the same network and I create this uh, additional embedding. Then the only thing that I try to enforce with the a contrastive loss here is that these embeddings should be uh, more near, so similar, uh, and uh, these instead uh, embeddings uh, with this um, uh, orange arrow would be uh, instead uh, should be as far as possible. So with this simple approach uh, would uh, result uh, in uh, in kind of quite state of the art, let's say, features that can be learned from uh, from big, um, um, for example, image data set like ImageNet. So this is also something that I think will be interesting to explore, uh, especially in relation to continue learning, where this sequence of, of images and data that you encounter over time is uh, is always new and is different from what you have, you have seen before. Uh, then another important line of research, I think, is uh, trying to put some doubts with respect to the basic optimization algorithm that we use uh, with deep neural networks mostly. Uh, that is gradient ascent, stochastic gradient ascent. And so this slide was taken from a uh, um, um, an invited talk by Radvan Pascano, that is uh, a well-known, let's say, uh, researcher, um, especially in, in the realm of optimization uh, for deep uh, neural networks, and and so uh, he argued that uh, a force gradient-based optimization has been designed and is working uh, with this IID assumption and uh, an iterative scheme that is able to process uh, data multiple times, right? Um, and uh, the same data multiple times. And so this is this is a model that, uh, as a tug of war dynamic uh, where, uh, you, you know, the, the, here there's a, there was an animation of these two guys pulling the same <laughs> rope, uh, but essentially it's, it, what, it's what uh, Green in the Sun is doing and each way it is trying to pull, uh, um, say, the, 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 to, to different gradients, uh, the, the, the way to himself and, and and essentially, it's, it's a very delicate uh, iterative process uh, that uh, in the end would, would find an equilibrium. But uh, this is uh, totally, let's say, disaligned with the objective learning continuity where you don't have uh, this, this notion of where you want to get in the future right, in terms of this equilibrium. Uh, so um, it's clear, I think, that um, we would need to think uh, uh, of alternative, let's say, optimization uh, algorithms that would better fit, I would say, a continual learning uh, scenario, or at least model a change um, our main optimization uh, algorithm to get in the sand to um, make sure that this is uh, taken into account in a more principled way. Uh, then, then there is also this nice inter in integration, let's say, um, uh, interesting. Um, possibilities that may arise by the intersection of continual learning with active learning. Uh, that, there's a lot of we'll, uh, um, literature that we can explore there to actually uh, try to, for example, lay, uh, let's say, um, give to the model, to our algorithm, particular interesting supervised signals on demand based on specific needs. And uh, as uh, I, I was I, I shown in the second lecture in this course, there are, there are many interesting ways in which the interaction with the environment and active uh, learning may provide uh, interesting solutions uh, to continual learning agents. Uh, so we, we, of course, uh, as we mentioned before, with the icing and the, the cake uh, formulation from Lecan, 
it is true that we cannot solve everything by direct supervision and uh, active, let's say, parent supervision, right? Uh, uh, but it, it may provide maybe more help than what we are, we are, we think uh, it may. Uh, and uh, so this is definitely something we want to explore, especially uh, for tackling practical applications uh, today. Uh, oops. Oops lost uh, control over it. Okay. Okay. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, there is also all these uh, these um, approaches that are in the middle, let's say, with respect to this level of supervision uh, that are also quite aligned with the continued learning um, objectives of, uh, of uh, learning over time with, with less supervision as possible and uh, namely weekly and semi-supervised learning approaches uh, and uh, for example here I reported a particular approach in which maybe you can think of starting from a very uh, let's say a, a reasonable effective model that's been trained in a supervised way from that point on is that you want to uh, update the knowledge about this model over time without any supervision. Um, so that's a reasonable uh, assumption in some particular applications that, that may be definitely uh, exploit uh, at our advantage. Um, then finally, there's another interesting uh, line of research that we, we, all, we, always, uh, we also trying to pursue here at the University of Pisa, and it is trying to, um, let's say, see how uh, randomization and randomized networks uh, may play a role, uh, not, not only in machine learning in general, but specifically for continual learning machines. So there are some evidence uh, that is suggesting somehow that even uh, biological learning systems uh, may work with, uh, with, with this, uh, say, uh, at least a part uh, of the um, uh, non-dynamical non system that is uh, random and can be exploited in terms of properties that may arise from this randomness. Uh, so this may be a very interesting approach uh, to pursuing continuous learning, especially to reduce, uh, well, uh, the, the overheads that we may encounter, uh, the tra famous trade-offs we discussed multiple times, uh, efficiency and effectiveness, but also um, provide a way, for example, to reduce forgetting as in random neural networks, uh, there's no, mostly not learning involved. And so there's also less interference. Um, so in this slide, I just uh, reported the same uh, method that we discussed previously on super mask and superimposition that uh, somehow uh, is based on a similar idea of uh, creating masks and, uh, and and leveraging, let's say, the, the, the actual um, uh, random weights at the initialization. So here I report also a number of different uh, um, papers that have been proposed recently on the topic that it is a completely not a representative list, it's just a few papers that I, I recall, they, they focused on uh, unsupervised learning and continuous learning. And so you may start uh, looking at this one and, and maybe follow the trail and see if there are more papers that may be interesting for your own specific uh, problems. Okay, so one last uh, few set of slides uh, and um, uh, talking instead about uh, the idea of continual learning uh, uh, and uh, its impact on the concept of sustainable AI. I think it's quite interesting and important also to point out that continual learning is not only a paradigm shifting approach, but um, in machine learning, but may be also seen as a key enable, enabler for uh, more sustainable AI, artificial intelligence developments. Um, so we try to start by uh, so looking at this uh, impact that continual learning may have. In this paper, we recently published Sustainable Artificial Intelligence Through Continual Learning uh, by Kosu et al. And, uh, I think that's a nice starting point to start uh, investigating this better. And uh, essentially, the idea is that if we look at the different uh, principles that uh, we would uh, endow our AI system with, then we can uh, call, uh, um, you know, uh, somehow align with the, with our ideas of sustainable AI. Then uh, 
uh, well, there are different properties, uh, emerging properties that, that we would uh, we would uh, like to have, and there are different uh, uh, papers that suggest a different set of properties. But I think that we can reasonably agree that this set that we have depicted here in this slide are indeed interesting uh, properties, uh, nevertheless. So, for example, we would like to to have a, an AI agent that is able. Uh, not only to be accurate and effective in the task that it is, is able to solve, but should, able, but it also, should also uh, be more robust uh, to catastrophic failures and uh, and provide some some form of uh, quality of service. Uh, uh, you know, um, agree. Uh, let's say um, um, standard as we would ask for a human, right? So we we, we assume um, a person in charge of a particular task. Not only is able to solve the task proficiently, but is also to solve imminent problems and uh, robustly, let's say, provide support in case things uh, go south. Uh, then uh, there is the, the second important uh, concept of explainability, transparency, and accountability that is not uh, that obvious for for uh, AI agents. Uh, there is the notion of uh, being uh, less as possible subject to bias and be as uh, fair as possible with respect to specific minorities, uh, um, with respect to the concept we are modeling or or the users so we are uh, targeting or we are facing uh, or we are providing support to. Uh, and then we have the standard notion of privacy and security. And finally, a more, I'd say, large, uh, impactful uh, um, result in terms of uh, of human societal and environmental well-being uh, so we would like to have our system to be more in line with uh, the human culture and and, uh, and objectives and uh, ideals uh, to be socially uh, in, impactful in a positive way and to be as sustainable as possible with respect to the environment and so i think that for each of those we can see continue learning as having a kind of a profound impact and so, so because we, we often uh, stick to this idea of trying to define these emerging uh, properties, but we never make the step to try to, to see what are the ca actual key, uh, key uh, technological enable that will make this step to be possible. I think that continual learning may be seen as actually one of those important technology advancements that would allow us to, to take and to develop these emerging properties. Uh, so the first, um, uh, uh, for example, an accuracy in Robinson, well, it is clear that continual learning is, is a part of the result centered in this idea of providing uh, a way to not not be perfect and to act perfectly in the world but to recover fast from its failures and to adapt fast and in an efficient way uh, to new constraints situations that we have never seen before so this is quite important for robustness and autonomy and this is uh, i think one of the few uh, paradigms in learning uh, machines that uh, would allow for that at least in, in terms of objectives. Uh, then in terms of bias and fairness, we have seen that continual learning may be seen as the new agile, right, of software uh, development. So instead of uh, developing new features by hand, now that our systems are based on complex uh, predictive pi pi pipelines and models, the only way to patch effective, uh, in an effective and efficient way our um, uh, software is to indeed provide neural patches, right? And uh, just uh, update our uh, biased models with new information, new data that we acquire over time. So this is the natural way in which you can easily patch a system that is biased in a sense, is not doing what it is supposed to do, or it is unfair with respect to its out outcomes. Uh, and this goes also for privacy and security. So once you realize that the system is subject to some failures in terms of privacy and security, you should be able to easily patch it, not just restart from scratch and collect new data entirely or uh, restart the whole um, pipeline and, and training from scratch. And in terms of a human societal and environmental well-being, well, especially environmental well-being, I think that a continuity may provide uh, an important uh, um, shift in the methodology of, of, of learning machines as um, the, the focus will be not only on the effectiveness of our solution but if, uh, but an efficiency and scalability um, so we would like to use less energy consumption and less co2 emission and uh, work towards a more sustainable and i would say progressive by design approach where again, the idea is not to just maximize one particular metric uh, of our AI agents, but also take into account the efficiency and uh, this uh, ability to, 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 
to to use what we learned before uh, to to be um, more uh, impactful, effective, and efficient in, in the future learning. And uh, finally, if we want to also link continuous learning to these uh, particular uh, explainability, transparency, and accountability properties, then I think that even in this case, even if it is not that apparent, then we're still leveraging, especially for deep continuous learning, like these uh, neural networks are kind of a black box, uh, if you ask someone, uh, then um, even in this case, the continuous learning provides a way to somehow understand better what are the main, um, um, let's say, principles, computational principles uh, of, let's say, uh, biological learning systems and, and uh, provide a path towards more neuroscience grounded, human centered AI systems overall. I believe, even though Antonio may say, may argue differently <laughs> in the continual distributed learning approach. Um, and uh, okay, so um, now we have just a few questions that I wanted to leave to you. I don't, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, but um, I think these are a couple of questions you can uh, think through, you can use to stimulate a bit uh, your, your, your imagination, your creativity, based on the things that we have discussed in this course and uh, trying to, to get a step further. Um, so for example, uh, we discussed several approaches to actually solve this uh, stream of, uh, of experiences over time, but uh, are we actually learning robust deep representations continually? Is that true? Can we do better? Um, then are the currently addressed scenarios and evaluation metrics enough for continued learning? So are we targeting, let's say, our objective well through these uh, evaluation schemes and metrics? Uh, what is the right level of supervision for continuous learning agent? We have seen there are many different approaches that leverage different le levels of supervision. What's the preferred one? Uh, so how to know what to forget and what to remember? So the focus has been always right, you know, in, uh, right now in the continuous learning community to accumulate knowledge over time and to actually not forget. But we know that forgetting may be a key um, uh, property of a learning system to reduce, for example, bias the knowledge you acquired over time. And so what's the relation with the idea of concept drift, uh, virtual and uh, real, as we discussed in a previous lecture? What's the impact of replay? It is reasonable to use replay. It is aligned with a neuroscience grounded vision. Can we do better? Um, then is computation more important than memory? Uh, maybe memory is not uh, a problem at all, so we can store everything and uh, we, are, we want to just focus on computation. Uh, metrics related uh, efficiency uh, related metrics uh, is great to understand the right algorithm to learn continually and uh, what's the relationship between continual meta learning and meta continual learning uh, and uh, uh, what is the relationship with respect to sequence learning and continual learning as uh, some ideas we discussed uh, uh, in this lecture so this is just a 10 questions and a couple more here that you can see uh, you can use as I say to to question your own understanding of continual learning, so what we have seen in the course, but also something that is not totally clear, even to myself or, or the people working in this area. So I think uh, you may provide, I'll say, more concrete and uh, comprehensive answers to these open questions. Um, so there are uh, many different uh, uh, interesting um, um, research questions that uh, are even more, let's say, grand <laughs> and, and, uh, and complex. Uh, for example, this idea of curiosity and its relationship to continued learning. Uh, again, the relationship with continued curriculum learning, as uh, Rudy asked also in the, in the forum. Uh, the concept of compositionality that is known to be a key uh, property of, of uh, uh, biological learning systems. And the self-reflection, so how can a continuous learning agent um, accurately, let's say, predict the quality of the learned functions uh, and so essentially um, um, surpass the impasse, uh, you know, um, and, and, and that had its own uh, shortcoming. And uh, then something even more grand would be to start thinking at uh, continuous learning, not just in terms of uh, um, neural models, parametric models that can learn from data, but also to see how can we think of a more coherent agent that uh, are also able to model, let's say, uh, knowledge and reasoning in an higher, let's say, abstraction level. And so for the future of continual learning, um, 
uh, in terms of uh, short, uh, medium term, uh, I think that it would be uh, uh, reasonably reasonable to see more natural scenarios proposal. So there's more, more about liberalization, if you want, uh, in terms of uh, the sad things we explore during this course and uh, and that has been the subject of uh, explorations for recent continuing learning literature. Uh, we are going to see more, as I think, uh, approaches with respect to um, unsupervised training uh, regimes, and we are going to see more complex and articulated hybrid continuing learning strategies, and finally, I guess, uh, some uh, new interesting applications. Um, and in, in, in long term, instead, I think that we will come back somehow to this idea of, uh, let's say, fundamental a uh, more grand uh, question about the agent architecture. So what, what are continuing learning agent overall should possess in terms of uh, properties and, uh, and abilities, uh, not just related to, to learning. Um, and um, and uh, I think that you can refer with respect to this vision, actually to things that have been proposed in the past. Uh, um, and uh, there is a, a nice tutorial uh, at ECML from Mitchell, uh, that is one of the main proposer of the never end learning um, um, let's say approach and it was more ground in his goals and his endeavor and was in, indeed focusing mostly on the architectural level uh, try to define what, what an, a really an, a never ending learning agent uh, uh, is uh, should, should, should possess and how it should be developed um, instead of focusing on on this short as a reasonably short amount of experiences we are using right now to model a learning algorithm right continue learning algorithm OK, so and uh, finally, there, there is these the two paths that I think are quite interesting and uh, uh, are uh, alternative uh, uh, somehow. Uh, neuroscience is part one <laughs> that uh, is, is more focused on this agent centric view of continuing learning and is more of a distributed continuing learning um, path that is in, instead uh, departing, if you want, from this uh, notion of uh, neuroscience grounded approach to AI and, and uh, learning. And uh, we are going to hear from uh, from Antonio uh, right now um, a bit more about this very interesting line of research. So I don't know if we want to, OK, we want to make a five minutes uh, break. Uh, maybe if there are some questions right now, uh, we can take a few. OK, not here. Uh, not even in uh, at home. OK, so that's great. So let's uh, regroup in five minutes and let's hear from Antonio about uh, distributed continuous learning. So you have seen a lot of talk about uh, biologically plausible continual learning systems. And now instead, I will make the case for uh, distributed continual learning, uh, why it's useful and very much needed. And uh, a possible implementation of uh, how to do it in a recent paper that we uh, published on archive. Okay, so you already know uh, what a continual learning agent is, but this is the uh, basic idea that you have right now. You have uh, an agent, a neural network, learning on some data and solving a problem like a classification problem. And uh, this data is changing over time, and the model is uh, also changing to uh, integrate the new knowledge inside without forgetting the uh, old one. And this is um, inspired by uh, biologically plausible system. So up to now, we know that the human brain is the best continual learning system that we know of. For, for the moment, at least. And uh, many continual learning strategies uh, try to be uh, more biologically plausible because uh, many people believe that this is uh, the way uh, towards a uh, better continual learning system and uh, more general uh, models. Here, for example, you have a picture of the literature where you have two uh, different axes. The how much the methods are uh, neuroscience uh, grounded and how much they are uh, practically effective. So how high the accuracy is on uh, common benchmarks. And you have uh, some methods that are uh, completely based on uh, mathematical definitions. So there is zero um, biological plausibility. Then you have methods 
like the um, hierarchical temporal memory, which are uh, designed to be uh, more biologically plausible. Then you have uh, deep learning methods, which are kind of in the middle, and uh, deep continual learning, which uh, strives to uh, make uh, deep learning models more biologically plausible. And overall, uh, this idea of uh, continual learning based on the biology uh, can be uh, described as a kind of uh, agent-centric learning. So the idea is that a continual learning algorithm is training a single agent. Here in the picture, we have the example of a robotic arm, just because I like the idea of having a physical robot learning something. And uh, the robot is learning to grasp uh, different objects over time. And you have uh, different desiderata, which are uh, needed uh, because of the biological plausibility and because of the constraint that you find in uh, real world environments. So for example, you want uh, usually replay free continual learning because in the um, real world, you don't have, you don't always have the ability to uh, replay the input as is. You may have some kind of generative model to do the replay, and this is uh, more biologically plausible, but the ability of uh, replaying the exact same example is not something that the brain is probably able to do. Then, of course, you have the limited computational resources because uh, the brain is uh, fixed, and uh, this is also a limitation in uh, machines. So, of course, you don't have uh, always the, a growing budget when you have a growing data stream. And then you have some other uh, constraints or desiderata which are given by the environment, like the ability to learn on task-free uh, streams because you don't have the task labels in most of the uh, learning scenarios, and the ability to do online continual learning, so learning when you, uh, when you receive the data in uh, one example at a time or in very small mini batches. So you have a very long streams and very small uh, learning experiences, which is uh, an extreme setting for the continual learning, uh, probably uh, the most uh, realistic and general that you can have. But now, uh, I mean, I will show you, to, I will show to you that uh, instead there is a different point of view, which is the point of view of distributed continual learning, where we have uh, different issues, different kinds of the desiderata, and uh, different opportunities also that the um, continual learning models, uh, as they are uh, used today, are not able to uh, exploit efficiently. In a, in a distributed continual learning uh, environment, you again have that uh, continual learning algorithm is training a single agent. So this is uh, the same as you have before. But instead of having a single robot, you have a fleet of robots, and each robot is learning to grasp different objects over time. They are not learning necessarily on the same environment, so uh, different robots may know uh, different objects. And there are uh, some desiderata that you uh, would like to achieve that are uh, not possible with the uh, continual learning algorithm that you uh, know mostly, such as the reuse of expert knowledge, because again, uh, you have uh, these different models which are able to grasp different objects, but uh, you need uh, an algorithm that is able to combine the knowledge of these uh, different models. And uh, you want this algorithm to work uh, efficiently because each robotic arm has a limited computational ability again. And also, this is a distributed environment, so there is uh, not necessarily a, a single centralized server where the knowledge is collected all together, but it's more like a peer-to-peer -peer communication where the agents may share their knowledge, these uh, skills, but uh, they are not forced to do so. So this is related also to the independence of the agents, which is 
for example, uh, the primary difference with uh, similar scenarios like federated learning, where instead you have uh, centralized control and everything is easier because the server is dictating the training loop and now the models, the clients are communicating between them. And uh, so one advantage of having the independence of the learning agents is that each agent can guarantee its own privacy. So for example, if an agent does not want to share the training data, he can keep it uh, private for himself. And uh, I mean, this is something that enables you to uh, share uh, with uh, much more freedom because even though an agent does not want to share the data, may be able to share something like the model parameters, which uh, can guarantee you uh, the privacy. And uh, this is uh, the scenario that we proposed. X model continuous learning is the idea of learning from models. So uh, X model comes from the Latin, which means uh, from model. And uh, the basic idea is that instead of using uh, the training data, you learn from uh, expert models. So here on the left, you have uh, the classic continual learning setting where e each experience uh, contains uh, a batch of training data, for example, new classes. And over time, you encounter the new classes. Instead, in this uh, new scenario, the X model continual learning scenario, you have that each experience contains uh, an expert model. Here, FS are the uh, model's uh, parameters, which are trained on some uh, subset of the data. So it's a specific skill, like the ability to uh, classify uh, some classes. And you receive uh, different models over time, and you want your continual learning model to learn how to uh, incorporate all the knowledge from these uh, experts inside uh, your uh, continual learning model. This is a paper that we have uh, on archive. It's a preprint. Uh, so you can find, of course, the details there. Here, I'm just giving you a um, high level picture. So and once we uh, give the model the ability to learn from the uh, uh, models parameters instead of the data, we achieve a number of uh, interesting properties, which again are not possible with the uh, common continual learning algorithm. For example, uh, the ability to reuse the knowledge from the different expert agents by uh, sharing the parameters, which is much easier than sharing uh, large data sets. And this is very useful, for example, when you want to uh, when you have uh, lots of local personalized models and you want to uh, combine them together, or maybe you have a large pre-trained model which has been uh, published just now and you want to integrate it inside uh, your own continual learning model. Then uh, the ability to do uh, distributed learning because um, since these agents are all independent, they can, uh, for example, learn in environments where there is uh, no connectivity, no need to communicate between them. And then at some point in the future, they may choose to uh, share the knowledge by just uh, sharing the uh, model parameters. Then you have the uh, sample efficiency because in general, uh, learning from raw data when you have uh, high dimensional perceptual data like uh, high resolution images is uh, very inefficient. You need uh, lots of data augmentation, you need lots of uh, redundancy. And instead, if you learn from the model parameters, you have uh, the opportunity to be more efficient because you are learning from a form of uh, compressed knowledge, uh, which may be uh, more efficient to, uh, to learn from. And finally, the last point is the privacy, because uh, again, if you share the model parameters, it's uh, very easy to make them uh, uh, private by, for example, using uh, uh, differential privacy. And this is already possible with uh, uh, 
to train a model using differential privacy. So each agent can set its own privacy constraint and uh, share only a differentially private version of the model. And so this is what we did uh, in our paper. And we made a couple of uh, very strict assumptions. In some sense, we are studying uh, the distributed continual learning in the uh, uh, hardest and most constrained setting possible, because in this way, we can guarantee to be uh, very general and uh, be, it, it will be possible to apply this algorithm in every distributed continual learning scenario. So we assume that the model, uh, the continual learning model never gets access to the original data, but only to the uh, expert model parameters. And also we assume that we cannot maintain all the experts in memory, but only the last one, because the stream of experts can be uh, very large. It's a continual stream. And uh, we only want to keep the the last expert. Then, uh, since we don't have the original data, we are allowed to generate a set of uh, synthetic uh, training samples from the uh, expert model, or we are allowed to have uh, out, of, out of distribution data. For example, if you are training on natural images, we can collect images from the web, like uh, uh, the ImageNet data set. And we assume that some kind of uh, out of distribution resource like that may be available. And uh, again, this is done with the idea that we want to enable two main applications. One is the idea of having uh, the possibility to do efficient integration on demand of uh, neural skill. So uh, model with uh, specialized knowledge that we want to integrate inside our own continual learning model and also uh, achieving uh, privacy by design. So the idea that we never share the data which stays private on the source device. This is uh, an high level overview of the actual algorithm. Of course, again, you find the details on the paper. This is just to uh, give you um, an idea of the possible solution. And it's based on, the, uh, on a process which is called data-free knowledge distillation. So we have uh, the continual learning model trained at the previous time step. We have the uh, expert that we have uh, currently received from the stream, and we want to um, integrate them together into a single model. And uh, data-free knowledge distillation is a knowledge distillation process, like, you know, uh, learning without forgetting. Just here you have the um, additional complexity that you have two different models from which you want to distill. And uh, also you have the additional complexity that you don't have access to the original data. So you need this kind of uh, synthetic data generation, which is uh, uh, kind of hard to make it work, as we will see. So the idea is that, again, there are two possibilities. Either you generate the data from the um, experts model with techniques that are called like uh, model inversion or deep inversion, or you have out of distribution data that you use to do that knowledge distillation. And the quality of the data that you use is very important for the uh, final performance of the model. So uh, if you are uh, good at uh, extracting the data, then you will get a good performance. Otherwise, it's very difficult. But the big advantage is that here there are no assumptions about the, the expert model, so it can be any uh, deep neural network. It can be trained with whatever uh, training loop hyperparameter that you like. It's completely agnostic uh, to the uh, uh, continual learning scenario and the details of the uh, expert model. We have some results in the paper that you can look at. Uh, so I just want to point out maybe one result. So let's look at uh, MNIST in the new class uh, settings. And uh, the last three are the mm, uh, knowledge distillation based uh, strategies. You can see that we get up to uh, 43%. And 
while uh, this may not seem like a high accuracy, you have to consider that this is a scenario where uh, you don't have replay, so you don't look at the old data, but you don't even look at uh, the current data, so it's even uh, it's much more challenging, for example, than the uh, replay free class incremental learning that is common in the literature because, uh, because I mean, uh, you don't have any data. So the, the, um, the proposed strategy kind of works, but there is still uh, a lot of potential improvements between the performance that we get and the uh, potential uh, upper bound of these uh, strategies. And these are the challenges that we have, uh, that we need to solve in this setting. So first of all, the knowledge distillation is a very complex task. The data-free knowledge distillation is an open problem, still unsolved, uh, especially if we, we want to train on uh, High dimensional data like uh, ImageNet or uh, Core 50. And the main difficulty is that while it's easy to generate uh, samples that resemble the original classes, it's very difficult to generate a diverse set of training samples and a high number of samples with enough diversity to make the knowledge, knowledge distillation actually work. Also, there is a problem of uh, efficiency in, with the current technique because the uh, knowledge distillation in general is very computationally intensive, but there are possible alternatives like uh, ensembling method based on uh, selective pruning, so identifying the important parameters and trying to combine them together, which uh, may be an interesting avenue for uh, future research and definitely much more promising with regard to uh, the uh, computational cost of the algorithm. And then, of course, uh, here we uh, tackled a, um, a very difficult scenario, but it's possible to uh, relax some of the constraints. For example, we can assume that instead of having only the uh, experts models, some of the learning experiences, maybe uh, actual uh, learning data with the original samples, and some of them have only the, the expert model, or maybe we have access to a pre-trained generator, so we can uh, generate the data from the generator instead of generating um, with the model inversion, which is uh, much more difficult. So there are if you go into specific applications, there are uh, lots of simplification that you can do to uh, increase the accuracy by uh, a lot. And in general, the ability to uh, do distributed continual learning opens up uh, lots of uh, interesting application, especially if you Here, federated learning requires uh, frequent synchronization, so you need a large bandwidth because uh, uh, at every update or every few updates, you need to uh, share the models with the server, you need to uh, merge them, and you need to propagate the updates to the client. And also you need a centralized protocol, uh, which makes uh, lots of assumptions. Often you have homogeneous architectures, you have uh, that the method is not designed to handle non stationarity. So, in the end, we can say that um, federated learning is like a uh, constrained version of X model continual learning where you assume to have uh, control over all the agents and you assume to control al also the uh, communication between them. While uh, X model continual learning is more like a, a peer to peer. Uh, environment where the agents are free to communicate as they uh, want. And uh, so again, this opens up the path for, uh, for example, a marketplace of neural skill where you can uh, put different uh, neural uh, networks in a repository 
and uh, models can integrate the different knowledge just by uh, downloading the model and applying an exponential continual learning strategy. And I think in general, this will become uh, more and more useful over time because uh, this is uh, the computing framework where uh, that we use is distributed. So of course we will need some kind of distributed continual learning to uh, exploit it in the optimal way. And okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much, Antonia, for the great presentations. I think we can uh, quickly. Uh, we have a question. question. Yeah. Okay. There is a question from Angelo. Uh, where can I find out more about these Lex model continuous learning strategies? Oh, okay. There is the paper on archive. Uh, there is the title of the paper here on the slide, but I will put the link on the chat now. Yeah, you can uh, also click directly on that uh, paper. It's, it's a link. Oh, okay, okay, it's a link. Yeah. So you can directly click on that. And you have access to the apps <laughs> on the slide, so that's even easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, on the paper, there are all the, the references to the distillation strategies. There is the GitHub repository with the implementation. I have to put the um, retrained model still, but um, the strategies are already there. Perfect. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. So, do you choose which expert to have the extended knowledge from? Or yeah, this is something that we talked about. Uh, for the moment, we don't. So um, what we did in the experiment is, is that we took the um, classic, uh, classic incremental or continual learning benchmark. Like in the case of uh, split MNIST, we have uh, an expert model for uh, two classes at a time. So we have five different models and we learn, uh, so we have a stream of these models and we learn from them sequentially. But yeah, the idea is that in the future uh, you may have uh, lots of models, so you may have the possibility to choose the best model. And there are some papers that uh, provide some kind of metrics to determine whether um, a model can be uh, useful or not for the best checkpoints. So there is there is space in this direction, I think, but it's still something that we have to explore. Right. Oh, okay. Anything else? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio, again. Okay, uh, thank you. I leave the stage to Andrea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, now Antonio can leave the stage to uh, Andrea Reposto. He's going to present the a continual sequence learning uh, yep. research trajectory. He's currently investigating in his uh, PhD as well. Right? So he's, he's uh, one of the major experts, I would say, in his, uh, his talk. So they uh, are the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Vincenzo. So here we have also a brand new layout for the slides. I think you can you can like it, <laughs> just to spice things up. Uh, so. Um, I am going to talk about continual sequence learning, actually. Um, and the main difference that we are going to focus on is simply that in continual sequence learning, we are interested in learning from patterns that are temporally correlated. So it simply means that the input data are often time series, right? So here is an example of a time series in which you have different amount of, uh, of patterns at different points in time. Uh, these points, of course, are these uh, upper numbers here. So the sequence proceed from left to right, but um, differently from traditional sequence learning, in continual sequence learning, every now and then you have a drift. So this tilde, tilde symbol here represents the drifts in the input distribution. So the environment produces a different type of data from that point on. And since we are learning continually, we would really like our model to be able to address this kind of stream of input data correlated in time uh, in a continuous way. Uh, so the main difference here is that instead of having flat data like images or uh, tabular data, uh, you have structured data. And the structure is a sequence, a time series. Um, so I I'm trying to convince you that this 
kind of matters for continual learning. And there are many different reasons. So the first one that we will see um, in a few seconds is that temporal cor correlation between the patterns of a, of a time series may be very important. So um, it may hide powerful information, right? Um, and also with continual sequence learning, you can, uh, in some way, as Vincenzo previously mentioned, um, devise new continual learning scenarios. So beside uh, the, the usual ones, which you are accustomed to, uh, there are, I think, new possibilities. And we will see one example in natural language processing, which I would say uh, is currently the main driver of the field. So here we are talking about a subtopic, so a specialization, if you if you like, of continual learning, which is already a new topic, let's say one that is currently uh, being uh, studied uh, of machine learning. So the here uh, driving the field means publishing like uh, a few papers on, on this topic. Uh, but anyway, natural language processing um, already has some uh, some uh, results about about continual sequence learning. From our side, we will look at some results with recurrent models, which of course uh, are uh, are suitable to, to deal with sequences, as, uh, as you may know. And we will look at what happens when you apply con uh, continual learning strategies to recurrent uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, first, uh, yeah, the, the mother of all questions, basically, uh, why is this important? And uh, if you think about machine learning, the, the answer should be uh, should be quite obvious mm -hmm. because sequential tasks are really widespread in machine learning. So these are just a handful of, of those that I can think of, but you can really expand these, well, not least, but uh, these uh, unorganized cloud uh, a lot. So if you think about natural language processing, uh, a stream of words, in that case, stock prediction, so the, the values of the stock change in time, uh, robot control, uh, human activity recognition. There are lots of uh, applications in which data comes in sequences. And this is no surprise uh, because in machine learning we already we already know that. But for continual learning, you may notice that the environment producing uh, uh, those uh, tasks are largely non-stationary. So natural language, uh, natural language processing, for example, uh, can easily drift uh, its uh, it's data distribution over time because you simply change language or you adapt to new uh, new words uh, coming. Um, or for human activity recognition, you simply have to consider new elements coming in your in your data stream. So new environments, new activities, classes of activities. So all these environments are basically non-stationary. So we have to address this point if you, if we want to put an agent out there and learning. Uh, continuously uh, in, in, in those environments. Um, OK, so let's discuss uh, a bit more in detail, I would say, what are the challenges and opportunities of this continual sequence learning. And in my opinion, one of the most interesting uh, thing about that is that temporal correlation is a powerful source of information. Um, so we are used to patterns, samples, in which the features are completely uncorrelated between each other, and uh, the pixels of an image uh, have not a specific, let's say, uh, temporal correlation. But in, in the case of time series, of course, one pattern depends on the previous ones, because the, the previous ones cooperate and contribute to decide which and what is coming next. And this is uh, important in the sense that, uh, uh, first, as in traditional machine learning, you can exploit this fact to build unsupervised uh, tasks, like predicting what's coming next. And this is a powerful task, because we, we know about pre-trained models and now called foundation models uh, somehow. And uh, they are able to quickly learn new tasks very, very effectively. Um, but the temporal correlation may inform us also on something that is very important for continual learning. So what is important? in the current stream of data. So I haven't seen something in a while, and I would like to understand if this is for a reason. So I'm expecting to receive it uh, later on in time, or this is something that will never come up anymore for my model, at least for my understanding of the world. And this can impact uh, 
on existing continual learning strategies like uh, elastic weight consolidation, but anyway, on, in general, on uh, trying and, and understand what can be uh, object of forgetting. Um, and this is an interesting but complex part, I would say. Uh, one that it's easier, in my opinion, is really replay. So the way we do replay now is simply we take patterns from previous experiences, we put them on a in a buffer and then replay it. So uh, forward them to the model uh, at a later later point in time. But really uh, going so on the left, if I recall correctly, towards bio-inspired approaches instead of distributed. But um, what we do is not, as, as humans, is not simply replaying patterns. So instead, we like start from a uh, initial state which resembles one we already saw, and then recall the future of that initial state. And this requires, by design, temporal correlation. So if we saw something that reminds us of something else that uh, uh, happened in the future, starting from that seed, we are able to regenerate, even in our mind, that situation. And uh, in this way, we can apply replay not by storing all the, the entire sequence we have uh, to, to classify or to learn from, but seeds of that sequence in order to see if this is a, an effective uh, replay. So you generate, like in a generative model, the, the subsequent part of the sequence starting from the, the seed, let's say, and you can replay that like more or less we do uh, also in sleep. There are some, some evidence about this, but so alternative forms of replay, I think, are very interesting based on temporal correlation. And uh, I, I really, I would really love to see more works about, about that, but maybe we, we will be able to in, uh, in later times. Then there are, of course, also challenging, challenges in the sense that since you have to model and you want to model temporal correlation, you have to model it. So you have to, do, to, to have a memory of this temporal correlation, and this requires some machine learning models that have a memory. And you have to deal with computational efficiency. So if the stream, if the sequence is very long, you may incur in computational or memory costs, which are not uh, easy to solve, for example, in the rolling loop of recurrent neural networks, as, as we will see in a moment. As for these scenarios, I think that uh, you can easily apply all the existing ones, basically. So the X incrementals, task class incrementals um, are easily applicable. So as you can see here, the, the same image uh, used by, by Vincenzo, of course, he, he copied me. And uh, um, this is the, well, from this image, I think that it can stem different uh, continual learning scenarios. So in the um, many to one case, this is basically sequence classification. You have a sequence, you attach a class to the entire sequence. And this can be, uh, used to build a task incremental, class incremental uh, benchmark in a very easy way. So nothing new here. But then you can exploit the fact that this, this is a sequence and not simple patterns to improve over the existing approaches for online and streaming continual learning, which are already there, but uh, I would say not so much explored for, uh, for se sequential data processing. And of course, these are natural ways of extending these paradigms in which we have a sequence and in online streaming learning you take each element of the sequence at a time and learn continuously from it. Um, but let's say continual sequence learning is not limited only to these kind of scenarios and as we will see in a moment there are also other alternative ones, uh, of course combinations of, uh, of these uh, which may be, uh, for example, useful in natural language processing. Um, I think that's really the, the sequence learning problem here uh, shows the, its, fle its flexibility. So uh, you are, depending on the problem you are uh, trying to, to solve, you can design more challenging or even more realistic continual learning scenarios. Uh, okay, let me just start this brief tour of continual learning with recurrent neural networks, which has been my my focus uh, for for more than a year now. And uh, uh, recurrent neural networks are natural in these scenarios because they possess a shorter memory. So if you train a recurrent neural networks, uh, the network will learn the temporal correlation uh, in your time series. 
within, let's say, a reasonable uh, window of, uh, of correlation. And there are few contributions available, but there, there is something uh, around. And uh, um, for example, we tried uh, to, to extend an existing continual learning strategies for recurrent neural networks. And uh, this was the progressive neural networks, and we extended it, we applied it uh, actually to the recurrent neural networks and remove the need of the task labels, which is one of the greatest uh, disadvantage of progressive neural networks and I would say architectural strategies in general. Um, but you can check out the details on the paper. But the idea is that architectural strategies are quite uh, easy to adapt overall. So they are good choices, uh, I would say, for recurrent neural networks. Uh, we will see that regularization strategies um, sometimes reserve some surprises. And to, to understand why and in which ways, um, we published this, uh, this paper, which is both a review of the, the state of the art, so you can find the, all the references we, we had at that time on uh, recurrent neural networks and continual learning. I think it can be useful if you want to start looking around in this field. And an empirical evaluation of what happens when you apply uh, traditional continual learning strategies to recurrent neural networks. Uh, we managed to do that by using uh, uh, four benchmarks, basically. Two, you already know about them. They are the usual split and permuted MNIST, but applied, uh, well, transformed for sequences. So since they are images, you take each image uh, a subset of pixel at a time. And this was, us was useful because in this way you can um, decide what is the sequence length because you simply take more pixels le or less pixels at a time and you vary the sequence length in this way, which is useful <laughs> as we will see. And the other two benchmarks are simply for um, comparing in uh, the performance on data sets that are, I would say, naturally sequences. So the, the first one is uh, synthetic speech commands, which are uh, um, audio sequences. So you have to classify the, the spoken words from the, from the audio signal and quick draw in which you have to classify the drawing object from the sequence of strokes. So this is a sequence classification problem, as you can see here. So many to one problem in the, in the definitions given, given before. What we found basically, the, the main result is that uh, in all, across the different strategies we tried, uh, the sequence length uh, affects forgetting. So we studied catastrophic forgetting in the in these class incremental uh, scenarios and domain incremental scenarios uh, by using uh, different continual learning strategies coming from different paradigms. So we have regularization strategies, importance-based, and other kinds like learning without forgetting. Uh, we have hybrid strategies, uh, we have replay. So there is really a large uh, uh, amount of, uh, of space covered by these strategies. And th the basic trend here, as you can see in the plot, is a decreasing trend. So on the x-axis, you have the sequence length, and you can see that the accuracy on the y-axis decreases as the sequence length increases. And this is, uh, let's say, a smaller effect for replay strategies, as we would expect, because they approximate the IID distribution, but still, even those strategies for longer sequences uh, pays a cost. It's very high, for example, for importance-based regularization strategies, which really decreases their performance by a lot. So basically from working quite well, from not working at all. So when dealing with recurrent neural networks, and this is all the optimization process involved and rolled over the, the sequence length, so it's it seems also natural that the sequence length affects in some way the results, but when you use recurrent neural networks, you have really to pay attention and you cannot simply apply blindly all the existing strategies and expect all to, to, to go well. Um, so to, to solve this problem, at least to, to mitigate it, we decided to, to make a step further and use echo state networks. So echo state networks are random recurrent networks and basically, if these connections, random connections are untrained, you cannot forget in, the, in that part of the network. They are not changing over time, so there is no problem about that. And this is also the advantage that you can treat the reservoir as a pre-trained model. 
this is quite important for, for because, for example, many strategies leverages um, pre-trained model. We we saw AR1, but there are others. We uh, tried uh, deep streaming LDA here and found out that this strategy, which requires a pre-trained model, so basically deep random uh, recurrent networks are the only alternatives because we don't have a lot of recurrent models available pre-trained usually. But the deep streaming LDA uh, performs very well in, uh, in continual learning scenarios. And also, since the recurrent connections are fixed, you only have to train the linear readout, which is a linear classificator in most of the cases, but it can be a non-linear one. But if it's linear, you also have the advantage that your continual learning strategies has only to be applied on a linear model, so on a linear regression or logistic regression, not on a non-linear feedforward architecture, which is even simpler. And we know that echo-state networks can be efficiently implemented uh, and deployed on neuromorphic hardware. So we can also improve in some way uh, deployment uh, uh, efficiency. So also the results corroborate our hypothesis, let's say, as always, but I'm not showing those. You, you can look at the paper uh, if you want. So just to conclude, I, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what's coming in natural language processing for continual learning since it is one of the hottest topics uh, in, uh, in the field. And now we are uh, looking at transformers, of course, because transformers are the standard in natural language process nowadays. And you can imagine a scenario in which you have your language model, so a model that tries to predict what is the next word in a sentence, uh, and you have to update it. So the basic question behind is that you need to update your language model because word language in general changes. It, it may change in the domain of what you are talking of. It may be changing because new words are coming in, new topics, new domains, whatever you want. But your language model has to be uh, aligned, updated. And so if you update a model, as you already know very well, you incur in forgetting and also other problems for, from continual learning. And so there is the need actually to create a, um, a scenario that is a continual sequence learning scenario to test this kind of uh, hypothesis and what happens when you update your language model, uh, how can you measure this fact? Because a language model, a pre-trained language model in natural language processing basically doesn't do anything. It's useless. It's only useful if you fine tune it on some specific task. So. In this case, one of the, let's say, scenarios that we can think of, and actually some, someone thought of, uh, is this continual pre-training plus fine-tuning uh, scenario, in which you have your pre-trained language model, a transformer trying to predict the next word in the sentence, fine-tuned over different domains, so different data sets. Each of these DI is an experience, basically. And to evaluate uh, what happens when you update your language model, you have to fine tune, so train your language model on specific tasks and measure the performance. And you can measure different stuff. So you can measure how well you preserve the knowledge. So this is catastrophic forgetting, basically. You take a previous task, fine tune task, you train your language model, update it, and you see if the performance on that task is improved or not. Or you can test, for example, the temporal generalization. If you are as in this case of tweets, your experiences are split temporally instead of, cl of per class. You have that if you train on uh, tweets from 2020, um, you can measure the performance on tweets from 2021. So how well your language model is able to generalize to data in the future, basically, uh, on which has, um, it has not been trained on, but that may also come from a different distribution because in 2021, we may talk about something different. Well, this is the case for 2019 and 2020 for sure. So there is no COVID in 2019, but language model have to know COVID for 2020. So this is a variation, I would say, from the traditional continual learning scenario of class incremental or uh, and variations and a more complex one, if you, if you will, because in the evaluation, you, are, you have to train your model. This is something that not that's not obvious. Uh, we, we don't often see this, 
but in this case, for example, uh, it makes sense. So the bottom line is that um, continual sequence learning is, is interesting, at least from, from my point of view. Um, and uh, I would say that the main thing missing, apart from, of course, the community, which I, which I have to, to support uh, if, if interested in this, this trend, is as, as usual, real world applications. So how to impact re really on the world with such kind of, of research. But that's, I guess, it's uh, it's for the future, right? So yeah, uh, and thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Andrea. I think uh, you made uh, a couple of interesting points so that uh, our students here will appreciate. appreciate. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but nope. we can uh, get a few questions. If you have uh, some from Andrea here or in the <laughs> let, let me in check. The <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I think you can conclude. Okay, that's great. So let me just uh, have a few final words uh, before closing the, the lecture today. So uh, I wanted just to, to 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 conclude, let's say, the, the sequence of uh, of lectures, at least official lectures that we have uh, in our course uh, with a couple of uh, take home messages, right? Uh, and uh, so um, what we have seen so far is definitely within continual learning, um, a significant and growing interest um, about the topic that was kind of, it has exploded somehow recently um, and it keeps growing. Um, I, I don't know if continual learning is, is going to be like a mainstream topic within uh, deep learning and AI, but it seems it's, it's starting to become one. Uh, then uh, we have seen significant improvements over time in the last few years over standard benchmarks used in the literature. But the focus, I would say, is still mostly on simplified scenarios, uh, very much constrained and uh, on toy benchmarks. Um, and uh, as I mentioned multiple times already, uh, the metrics are still focused on, and, you know, performance evaluation and forgetting and uh, and accuracy results. And I think that can be much improved and would uh, help us direct, let's say, the focus of uh, future research in this field. Uh, then I want to stress the fact, especially for young researchers and students and enthusiasts out there, that. This field is, is very, very young and uh, it's ripe for explorations at different levels and different uh, with different directions. So I really invite you to explore and to go a little deeper in the topics that we cover in this very short course. Um, and as a take home message, I think that continual learning is uh, not, uh, again, an additional feature that we can endow our AI system with, but it's more of a, of a paradigm changing approach to AI and machine learning trying to break, I would say, the fundamental idea assumption that be always present in statistical learning theory. And so CL uh, also uh, is able to push towards, let's say, more neuroscience grounded approaches to learning, not only as we mentioned today, but it's definitely a good way to understand, let's say, even ourselves better and how we learn, what we mean by intelligent learning agents that can develop knowledge and skills over time in a sustainable way. And indeed, CL, can be seen as also a leverage towards uh, the next generation of truly intelligent agents that can robustly and autonomously interact with the, the world, with the external world, in an efficient, effective, but also scalable and sustainable way. Uh, so uh, with this, I thank you so much for your attention for today. I just wanted to remind you all that uh, we're going to have tomorrow, uh, at the same time of the actual lecture, uh, an event uh, that would uh, would be all around center, all around Avalanche, and indeed is it is the annual gathering that we have about the, the Avalanche development. So that will be the perfect time for you uh, to ask your questions about Avalanche and uh, even discuss how you can use it maybe for your own projects or for the exam, and how you can help uh, in general if you want to contribute to this open source um, um, you know endeavor uh, within Continual AI. So um, you can join this directly here, uh, physically, in this room, in Sala Seminari, yes, if you want. Uh, or you can join even remotely, just uh, make sure that you get the, the actual links. I don't know, maybe, Andrea, you can post it uh, now on the chat. So there is a, 
a joint, let's say, open link and a Microsoft, separate Microsoft Teams uh, a virtual room specifically created for the, the Avalanche that day. That day. Uh, you can find it on the website, on the official course website. Uh, and and uh, then uh, that's all right. I will send you a message nevertheless uh, tomorrow uh, with, with more information about the Avalanche that day. But remember that our adventure doesn't stop here. We will have our last final lecture, the 20th of December on Monday, with two I think, by the talks, one from Gada uh, here, Solker, uh, you can interact with her as well today, um, and one from Guido van de Van about, uh, let's say, neuroscience inspired approaches uh, to continue learning and, and interesting research um, uh, works that uh, Gada has, has carried forward. Then, also, more uh, detailed explanations about generative models and approaches uh, to continue learning that instead will be the main focus of uh, Guido's uh, talk. So um, that would conclude our, our let's say, um, continue learning course. And I wait uh, for your interventions and questions and active participation to these last two extra lectures that we're going to have. Of course, they will count. Uh, within the, 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 let's say, number of hours that we dedicated to the course. So that we, in case you are looking for, for example, credits uh, to be validated, that would be uh, put inside the final certificates that we release uh, for the course. So thank you so much again for your attention. Sorry if we uh, delayed the lecture uh, another five minutes. And uh, thank you so much. I'll see you next time. See you tomorrow. Bye.